Good evening and welcome. I'm Dwight McBride, and as president of the New School, I'm proud to be here with you this evening. Since beginning my role in April, it has been a great pleasure to learn about the many public programs at the New School. But I have to say, I was especially excited to learn that the New School has for over 20 years hosted the National Book Award finalist reading. This is such an important and wonderful celebration of writers and a very public way to lift up words and ideas that are profound, provocative, and transporting. And dare I add that this year especially, we can all use the diversion, the solace, and the inspiration that can be found in great books. The New School is very pleased to partner with the National Book Foundation on this event, and I want to thank our colleagues Lisa Lucas, the Foundation's Executive Director, and Anna Dobbin, Associate Director of Awards, for their good offices in this important work. And here at the New School, it is Professor Luis Jaramillo, Director of the Graduate Program in Creative Writing, who is the lead collaborator, facilitator, and enthusiast for this partnership. Professor Jaramillo and I are particularly pleased that this year's event includes a 2014 graduate of the New School's MFA in Creative Writing program, Kaysen Callender, who is a National Book Awards finalist in Young People's Literature. Kaysen joins an illustrious group of New School alumni, students, and faculty members who have been National Book Award finalists and winners. That list includes such luminaries as W.H. Auden, James Baldwin, Grace Paley, Frank O'Hara, and Sigrid Nunez. The study and practice of writing has always held a special place among the New School's distinctive academic offerings and progressive intellectual culture. And like the best programs at the New School, it has continually evolved to remain fresh, relevant, and bold. We're excited to hear from this year's finalists, and we extend our warm congratulations to them all. It is now my pleasure to hand the program over to Lisa Lucas. Good evening, and welcome to the 2020 National Book Award finalist reading. Thank you so much, President McBride, for your introduction, and thank you to the entire New School team, Luis Jaramillo, Lori Lynn Turner, and Kelly Stewart for hosting us again and again, and this time digitally, for one of the most meaningful evenings of National Book Awards Week, which is a little longer than a week this time. Tonight, we've gathered to celebrate the 2020 National Book Awards finalists. For the first time in our 71-year history, it's a gathering that is taking place entirely online. But that doesn't lessen its power or the great privilege and joy we feel in honoring work that we'll be celebrating together tonight, tomorrow, and for years to come. In the absolute best of times, this night has always sounded a little bit like a dare to me. Let's get all the finalists together to read. Nobody will go over. It'll only take 10 hours. It never really feels like that. But this year, it is more than a challenge. It's a necessity. We need the transformative power of literature. We need opportunities to be together, to say this is what we believe books can do. Tonight really is special, and I'm so glad that I'll be spending it with all of you and that we'll all be together listening to these awesome authors read. As you may know, this is my last finalist reading as executive director of the foundation. So this one is very special to me. I never thought I'd say it, but I can't wait until I get to come when I don't have to. Before we get much further, I'm going to take a moment to acknowledge the absolutely heroic efforts of our 2020 awards judges, who not only read over 1,690 submissions this year, but they did so without any physical paper copies. And then they managed to narrow that number down to 25 finalists. These finalists represent some of the most remarkable work being published today, and we couldn't be more pleased to honor them. The events that surround the National Book Awards are what we are best known for, but it is worth reminding that the National Book Foundation hosts educational and public programming across the country year round. Our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. In March, like most of the world, we had to cancel all of our in-person programs, but we took a step back 
and we rethought everything that we do. We thought about our education programs and found a way to bring things online, as well as make sure that our Book Rich Environments Program, a partnership with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, still got books out to children and families in public housing in a safe and socially distanced way. We brought our NBF Presents programming online in partnership with book festivals to foster dialogue through literature. We continued Literature for Justice, a program that uses books to help shed light on the issue of mass incarceration. And with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and in collaboration with our good friends, the Academy of American Poets and the community of literary magazines and presses, we launched the Literary Art Emergency Fund, distributing $3.5 million in relief funding to 282 of our fellow literary arts organizations. Collectively, our work has never been more necessary. And we do all this because we believe in the unparalleled power of books. Tonight's finalists remind us why. These 25 titles delight in all the forms literature can take, all the voices it can include, and all the ways it can connect us to an idea, to a place, to a community. They'll stay with you the way that great art always does. And we feel so lucky to be here tonight with you to experience together these stories and voices of these authors and translators who mean so much to us. And now to my dear finalists who are reading tonight, please read for only two minutes, just two minutes, not more than two minutes. There's a large group of you all, and we need to make sure that our audience doesn't revolt, even though they're at home behind a screen, and I can't threaten you with my traditional super soaker joke. Thank you to our finalists their teams, friends, families, readers, and to our many sponsors who make what we do together day in and day out possible. We're very, very grateful to them in this year. Penguin Random House, Central National Goddess Men, Amazon Literary Partnership, Barnes & Noble, Hachette Book Group, Simon & Schuster, thank you. And thank you to the board of the National Book Foundation who are wonderful and supportive and so on our side. And to the staff. Meredith Andrews, Natalie Green, Bev Rivero, Jordan Smith, Deanna Taylor, and Anna Dobbin, who has not slept in months. Thank you for the work you do. You are my favorites. This year's National Book Awards will be held online on November 18th. We'll put some comments in the link to help you RSVP for them, and we hope that you will also consider donating to our organization in support of the work that we do. We certainly need it, like all nonprofits in this year of pandemic. Thank you, all of us, for joining in tonight, whether you are working on the event or you're sitting at home watching. If you love these books, please support your local independent bookstores who champion books to make sure that they find readers. Check these books out of your local library. In the comments, the team will be putting in links to bookshop.org as well, so you can click through to purchase. On behalf of all of us at the National Book Foundation, we thank you and we hope you enjoy this magical evening. A few housekeeping things. This is how it's gonna go. There'll be five groups of readers, each group consisting of one reader from each of our five categories, young people's literature, poetry, nonfiction, fiction, and translated literature. The translated literature author will read briefly from the book in its original language, then the translator will read the same passage in English, giving us a sampling of Arabic, Spanish, Japanese, Swedish, and German. And I'll be back to introduce each new group of five and tell some bad jokes. And so onwards to group one. First up, we have Gabrielle Savit, Natalie Diaz, Gerald Walker, Ruman Alam, and Adania Shibli, the author of Minor Detail, which was translated from the Arabic by Elizabeth Jaquette. And now for our readers. Good evening, I'm Gabrielle Savitt, and I'm pleased tonight to read to you a short excerpt from my book, The Way Back, uh, which begins and ends in the little riverside village of Tupic. In those days, the ferryman was a fellow named Motke, a devoted souse who was rumored never once to have bathed. The entirety of Mutka's responsibility consisted of sitting close to the ferry, waiting to hear the ringing of a small bell that could be pulled from the landing across the river. Of course, 
The bell never rang. But in the event that it did, Motka's job was simple. He was to climb aboard the little ferry barge that sat tethered on the tupic side of the river, take hold of the chain attached to the far platform, pull himself across the current, and return with whoever had rung the bell. But of course, the bell never rang. There was no road passing anywhere near Tubic on the far side of the river, and it was almost impossible to conceive of someone slogging through the miles and miles of nearby swampland in order to end up there accidentally. This is why it was so very strange that, just as Yehuda Leib began to think about finding a place to steal a few hours of sleep, his ear was drawn down to the banks of the river by the unmistakable sound of a tinkling bell. Thank you. Iwanja Hotan, um, gracias for your energies and imaginations these past few months. The first water is the body at Ganav. The Colorado River is the most endangered river in the United States. Also, it is a part of my body. I carry a river. It is who I am. Hamakav. This is not metaphor. When a Mojave says, Inyech Hamakav Jidum, we are saying our name. We are telling a story of our existence. The river runs through the middle of my body. I have said the word river in every stanza. I don't want to waste water. I must preserve the river in my body. In future stanzas, I will try to be more conservative. The Spanish called us Mojave, Colorado, the name they gave our river because it was silt red thick. Natives have been called red forever. I have never met a native who is red, not even on my reservation. I live in the desert along a damned blue river. The only red people I've seen are white tourists sunburn after staying on the water too long. Hamakav is the true name of our people, given to us by our creator, who loosed the river from the earth and built it into our living bodies. Translated into English, Hamakav means the river runs through the middle of our body the same way it runs through the middle of our land. This is a poor translation, like all translations. In American imaginations, the logic of this image will lend itself to surrealism, or magical realism. Americans prefer a magical red Indian or a shaman or a fake Indian in a red dress over a real native, even a real native carrying the dangerous and heavy blues of a river in her body. What threatens white people is often dismissed as myth. I have never been true in America. America is my myth. Gracias. Hello, my name is Gerald Walker, and I'll be reading from my book, How to Make a Slave and Other Essays. The title of this essay is Breathe. One cause of your son's seizure, the doctor says, could be syphilis. Ask what's the basis for such speculation, given that no physical exam was conducted, no blood work drawn, no urine sample taken, and that your son who is lying on the hospital bed before you looking bewildered, is 12. Obviously, it's not unheard of for 12-year-olds to have this disease, she responds, which is impossible for you not to hear as, you're black, so I really shouldn't have to tell you this. But it is possible, apparently, not to lose your temper. Be grateful for the article you read last month about the benefits of breathing exercises in times of high stress because the one you're doing now is actually working. Before speaking, take another deep breath, followed by a slow exhale, focusing all the while on the air passing through your lungs. There. Now tell your family it's time to leave. Marvel at the calmness of your voice and wish you'd discovered this exercise years ago, long before your high blood pressure and reputation for being angry. Pat your son's shoulder as you nudge him upright. Take him home. Once home, in your study, do some Google searches. Start with syphilis. Tell yourself you know your son doesn't have syphilis, but be curious to see if the doctor was racist and dumb or only racist. 
Forget the doctor and just search adolescents and seizures. But when you reach the part about brain tumors, turn off the computer and work on your breathing some more. Thank you. I'm Ramon Alam, and I'm gonna be reading from my novel, Leave the World Behind. <clears throat> In the woods, you had this sense of something you couldn't see no matter how you tried. There were bugs, dun-colored toads holding still, mushrooms in fantastical shapes that seemed accidental, the sweet smell of rot, inexplicable damp. You felt small, like one of many things and the least important too. Maybe, maybe something had happened to them. Maybe something was happening to them. For centuries, there was no language to describe the fact that tumors blossomed inside lungs, beautiful volunteers like flowering plants that take root in unlikely places. Not knowing what to call it did not change it. Death by drowning as your chest filled with sacks of liquid. Rose felt eyes on her, but then she pretended often that she was being watched. She saw herself at the remove of a cell phone camera. She was young and didn't understand. That was how everyone saw themselves, as the main character of a story, rather than one of literal billions, our lungs slowly filling with salt water. In the woods, the light was different. The trees interfered with it. The trees were alive and felt like Tolkien's majestic creatures. The trees were watching, and not impartially. The trees knew what was up. The trees talked amongst themselves. They were sensitive to the seismic reverberations of bombs far distant. Trees miles away, where the ocean had begun to breach the land, were dying, though it would take years for them to be reduced to albino logs. The trees had all the time the rest of us do not. The mangroves could outsmart it, pull up their roots like a Victorian lady's skirts, sip the salt from the ground, so maybe they'd be fine with the alligators and the rats and the roaches and the snakes. Maybe they'd be better off without us. Thank you. My name is Adenia Shibli. I'm the author of Minor Detail. هدأ إيواء الكلب أخيرا وساد المكان شيء من الهدوء. كان الآن يعلو فقط نحيب مكبوت لفتاة تكورت كخنفساء داخل ثيابها السوداء وحفيف أوراق أشجار الدوم وأعواد القصب التي راح جنود يجوبون بينها. وبينما قام هؤلاء بتمشيط المكان بحثا عن أسلحة ما انصرف هو يتأمل روث الماشية في تلك البقى الخضراء المحاطة بكثبان رمل جرداء لا نهائية ثم أخذ يطوف بين الجمال المرمية فوق الأرض أشبه بتلال صغيرة كساه العشب اليابس كان عددها ستة وعلى الرغم من أن جميعها كانت ميتة وراحت الرمال تمتص دماءها إلى جوفها بتأودة صدرت حركات طفيفة من أطراف بعضها وقد استقر بصره هو على ضمة عشب يابس استلقت قرب فم أحدها وتم اقتلاعها من جذورها التي ما زالت حبيبات الرمل عالقة بها Hi, my name is Lissy Jaquet and I'm the translator from Arabic to English of Minor Detail This short reading is from part one the dog's howling finally stopped, and a degree of calm settled over the place. Now, the only sound was the muffled weeping of a girl who had curled up inside her black clothes like a beetle, and the rustle of thorn acacia, terebinth leaves, and cane grass, as the soldiers moved through the spot of green surrounded by endless barren sand dunes, combing the area for weapons while he stood there and inspected some manure. Then he walked around the camels lying on the ground, which resembled small hills covered in dry grass. There were six of them. And although they were dead, 
and the sand was languidly sucking their blood into its depths, a few of their limbs still gave off slight movements. His gaze rested on a clutch of dry grass lying by the mouth of one camel. It had been ripped up by the roots, which still held suspended grains of sand. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those wonderful readings. I love that we close out with translated literature and the original um, writing. This actually started in 2018 for the first time when we introduced the Translated Literature Award. And it was the first award added in over two decades. Um, and we're thrilled to be able to add a global perspective to this prize. Um, if you want to know who's going to win the third ever National Book Award for Translated Literature and all of the other categories, you should tune in on November 18th. We're also going to be awarding Lifetime Achievement Awards um, to Carolyn Reedy, who we lost this year, and the author Walter Mosley. Um, links in the chat. And now we have another group of wonderful readers. So I'd like to bring up uh, Victoria Jameson and Omar Muhammad. Anthony Cody, Jen Shapland, Douglas Stewart, Pilar Quintana, the author of The Bitch, which was translated from the Spanish by Lisa Dillman. And now back to our readers. Hello, my name is Victoria Jamison. I'm the co-author of When Stars Are Scattered with Omar Mohammed. And here to read a small selection from the book is Omar Mohammed. Just one. My brother and I live here in a refugee camp in, Ken in Kenya, Africa. The camp is called Dadaab. We were not born here. Hassan and I were born in Somalia. Some people here are from Ethiopia or Sudan or other places in Africa. But we all have one thing in common. We had to leave our homes because we were afraid for our lives. Some people who live here hope they will be sent to America or, or Canada or other places to live, not me though. I just want the war in Somalia to end so we can go back home. Our mom will be able to find us there. The dad is so big, it's actually made up of three separate camps. You can take a bus from one camp to another or you can, you can walk for about four hours. The Sagardera, which is named after the big tree, the Gahle, nam named after I don't know what. I live in Ifokam, which in English roughly translates to city of light. Don't let the name fool you though. We don't have electricity here. After so many years with so many people living here, Ifo is, is more like a city than a camp. We have markets, schools, mosques, hospitals, everything. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Anthony Cody, and tonight I'll be reading from my book, Borderland Apocrypha. This poem is titled La Corona, a Mexican lynching number 47. Anything can be trophy, just as anything can be ashtray, coffee cup, herb, flower pot, the inside of your wrist, the inside of another's wrist, Claim anything, any thing, witness, badge, halo, horn, colony, victim, vein, coffin, president, cadaver, the quiet breath of a body at rest, claim, 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 any thing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Shapland, and I'm reading from my autobiography of Carson McCullers. Um, I'm actually going to read you the end of the book, so spoiler alert. Um, and Carson McCullers, as many of you know, 
uh, is the beloved writer of The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. Mary Mercer was her therapist at first. Dream. On the one hand, the therapy transcripts come from early in Carson and Mary's relationship. They document a specific period of several months premised on therapy and a patient speaking to her doctor. On the other hand, they are remarkable and unique. A record of Carson's falling in love, her processing and coming to terms with that love, and along the way with her whole life of loves, especially for women and her failed marriages. We watch her emerge from the lonely cave she had conscribed herself to and walk painfully, honestly, into Mary's arms and presumably heart. I am presuming this. I believe in it. Not to believe in it, I think, is to reject all other documents of love as false, imperfect. If this isn't love, I don't know what is or care. Note to self, mail back Carson's keys. Euphemisms. To her husband, whom she married twice, Carson called her woman lovers imaginary friends. Her biographers called them traveling companions, good friends, roommates, close friends, dear friends, obsessions, crushes, special friends. I'm over it. I, for one, am weary of the refusal to acknowledge what is plainly obvious, plainly wonderful. Call it love. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Douglas Stewart, and I am the author of Shuggy Bain. And I'm going to read you from the beginning of the book, where we first meet uh, the proud, vain, beautiful, but calamitous mother that's at the heart of the story. Agnes Bain pushed her toes into the carpet and leaned out as far as she could into the night air. The damp wind kissed her flushed neck and pushed down inside her dress. It felt like a stranger's hand, a sign of living, a reminder of life. With a flick, she watched her cigarette doubt fall, the glowing embers dancing 16 floors down onto the dark forecourt. She wanted to show the city this claret velvet dress. She wanted to feel a little envy from strangers, to dance with men who held her proud and close. Mostly, she wanted to take a good drink, to live a little. With a stretch of her calves, she leaned her hip bone on the window frame and let go of the ballast of her toes. Her body tipped down towards the amber city lights and her cheeks flushed with blood. She reached her arms out to the lights and for a brief moment she was flying, but no one noticed the flying woman. She thought about tilting further then, dared herself to do it, how easy it would be to kid herself that she was flying until it became only falling and she broke herself on the concrete below. The high-rise flat she still shared with her mother and father pressed in against her. Everything in the room behind her felt so small, so low-ceilinged and stifling, payday to mass day, a life bought on tick, with nothing that ever felt owned outright. To be 39 and have her husband and her three children, two of them nearly grown, all crammed together in her mammy's flat, gave her a feeling of failure. Him, her man, who when he shared her bed now seemed to lie on the very edge, made her feel angry with the littered promises of better things. Agnes wanted to put her foot through it all, or to scrape it back like it was spoilt wallpaper, to get her nail under it, and to rip it all away. Thank you. Hello, I'm Pilar Quintana, and I will read from La Perra. Hola, mi nombre es Pilar Quintana, y voy a leerles un fragmento de La Perra. A veces, cuando bajaba al pueblo, Damaris iba a la casa de Doña Elodia a preguntar por los perritos. Doña Elodia se había quedado con uno que mantenía en el estadero dentro de la caja de cartón y al que seguía alimentando con la jeringa. Había conseguido repartir los demás entre conocidos de los dos pueblos, pero los cachorros se morían día tras día. Uno porque en su nueva casa lo había atacado el perro principal. Los siete restantes no se sabía por qué. Damaris trataba de convencerse de que era porque estaban demasiado tiernos y la gente no sabía cómo cuidarlos, pero las palabras de Luzmila sonaban en su cabeza una y otra vez. Vas a matar a ese animal de tanto tocarlo. Y pensaba que tal vez ella también estaba haciendo todo mal y un día de estos la perra iba a amanecer tiesa como sus hermanos. 
Hola, yo soy Lisa Dillman, traductora de La Perra de Pilar Quintana, y voy a leerles un trocito. Hi, my name is Lisa Dillman. I'm the translator of The Bitch, and I'm going to read you a paragraph. Sometimes when she went to town, Damaris stopped in at Doña Lodia's to ask after the puppies. Doña Lodia had kept one for herself, but she kept it at the restaurant in a cardboard box and still fed with a syringe. She managed to give the others away to acquaintances in one of the towns, but day by day the pups were dying. One, because the main dog at its new house attacked it. The other seven, no one knew why. Damaris tried to tell herself it was because they were too delicate and people didn't know how to take care of them. But Luzmela's words rang out in her head over and over. You're gonna kill that dog, you keep touching it so much. And she thought, she thought that perhaps she too was doing it all wrong. And that one of these days, the little doggy would wake up dead, stiff as her siblings. Thank you all so much for those beautiful readings. It's always been really special to hear everybody read from their work. Um, but now it's really special that I can see your houses. Um, so let's maybe do this this way forever. Just kidding. Um, one thing that we get to do every year is to partner with community colleges, HBCUs, book festivals, presenting houses, to take National Book Award honored authors speaking around the country. And before the pandemic, that meant that we were traveling to Idaho, Tennessee, Florida. Um, but right now we're doing a ton of online events in partnership this fall. Uh, and all of the joy and energy as you see tonight is still there. So I hope you'll join us and join others that are doing these events. And more importantly, I think now we've heard from 10 authors. That means that you have 10 books um, to borrow or buy. Um, so let's get to the next group since they are also fabulous. We have Candace Elo, Don Miche, Claudio Sant, Disha Filioff, and you, Miri, the author of Tokyo Uino Station, translated from the Japanese by Morgan Giles. And now to our readers. Hello, my name is Candace Elo, and I'll be reading from my novel, Everybody Looking, um, where Ada is attending her very first college party. Elliot throws up the black power fist, mocking Kendra's solidarity with his next freshman conquest, laughs to himself, opens his mouth to say something else to me. I hear nothing now, with my back turned but the sound of the music growing louder above the crowd. See how Kendra swings her hips with her eyes closed, lets herself sway solo to the beat. In just minutes, watch how many hands of sweaty unknown she swats dodging entitled boys' advances drawn to her free curves. Watch her wave off attention most girls wish for. Watch her shoe you know, away come I Watch her shoe away come-ons in the dark, attracted like flies to a dangerous light. She opens her eyes only for a second, coyly smiles with them, using them to invite me over. At first, I think to say no, then let my body take me. Minutes later, the crowd becomes a circle around me, around us, feeling the music like every song is mine, every drum kick bass line connecting her winding hips and my thighs moving in and out. We don't notice the crowd thicken till the DJ shouts us out. We still forget people are looking, feel myself lose it hearing hip hop, shift to soca, then become Afro beat, feel rhythms rock any inhibition I came with, feel every surface on me moisten, feel my center tingle, rise, heat. We're snapped back into reality when a girl whose face I can't really see bumps too hard against me on her way to the bathroom. A guy who looks familiar trails close behind her, one hand on the small of her back, holding her steady, a familiar wave of heads turns toward the shiny figure sparkle, beaming both from her lips and fingers covered in rings. I stand still, squint for a better look, Recognize the gloss, the sea of the same ad admirers, the dumb smile, charming and ugly, just before they disappear behind a closed door. Thank you. I'm Don Miche, and I'm reading from DMC Colony. In reality, we were all angels from DMC. We too mingled, laughed, and played under the skies of Panmunjom. Listen, angels, with the orphans who aren't orphans, with the obtuse, the third meaning, 
the passage from language to insignificance, to eternity, to colony, to colony. Halo to halo, hand to hand, we wave. Hello, angels. Dear angels, I speak to you today about the importance of nation, a nation that's not a nation. The American-backed angel of genocide has departed to Hawaii. Farewell forever. Now we must address our eternity, our eternity of obelisk, our eternity of oblong, our eternity of war. Are we orphans of beauty? Are we angels of eternity? Who are we really? Your Excellency, is it martial law? Is it of a grave significance? Is it written in a foreign language? Your Excellency, no, no translators are currently available. I squat beneath you. My film, a signifier without a signified. The American cabinet has no tolerance for foreign words. We, the nameless. Who are you? We are the angels of America. Who are you? We are the angels of America. We bow to no one in particular. Our vows are incomprehensible. Only the consonants pass from hand to hand, colony to colony. We cheer, we weep, we are E. We are E. We are eternally motherless. We are your orphans. We are your angels. We are your mirror words. What's written on paper is obvious. See you at DMC. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claudia Fonts, and I'll be reading from Unworthy Republic, my book about Indian removal in the 1830s. And here's the context for this passage. In the spring of 1838, the U.S. Army expelled nearly 15,000 Cherokees from their homelands in Georgia and herded them into camps across the border in Tennessee and Alabama, where they awaited deportation. So this passage describes the aftermath in Georgia. Throughout the region, houses stood empty of residents, and the objects of everyday life rested in place. A fiddle, chairs, a bed, a spinning wheel, a cooking pot, a bag of dried fruit, a playing horn. But this eerie absence of people was only temporary. Troops stole much of the Cherokee's property, and work hands followed soon after to collect what remained for auction by the federal government. John Dawson bought four axes that belonged to Taliska, tools that the planter probably turned over to his nine slaves. <clears throat> Mr. Sloan purchased Chewy's fiddle. Mr. McSpadden bought Crabgrass's canoe. John Oxford purchased Amatiska's pot, and Miss Goddard bought Soap's bed. U.S. citizens moved into Cherokee houses, slept in their beds, and ate out of their pots. The occupiers used sheep shears, hoes, and fishing spears, augers, baskets, and fiddles that still bore the handprints of the original owners. The irrigation of Cherokee things, as bizarre as it was, went without comment in the Southern press. Thanks. Hello, I'm Disha Filia, and I'm going to read from my short story collection, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. I'm going to read the beginning of a story called Peach Cobbler. My mother's peach cobbler was so good, it made God himself cheat on his wife. When I was five, I hovered around my mother in the kitchen, watching, close enough to have memorized all the ingredients and steps by the time I was six but not too close to make her yell at me for being in the way and not close enough to, um, to and not close enough to see the exact measurements she used. She never wrote the recipe down. Without having to be told, I learned not to ask questions about that cobbler or about God. I learned not to say anything at all about him hunching over our kitchen table every Monday, eating plate after plate of peach cobbler and then disappearing into the bedroom I shared with my mother. I became a silent student of my mother and her cobbler making ways, 
even when I was older and no longer believed that God and Reverend Choi Neely were one and the same, I still long to perfect the sweetness and texture of my mother's cobbler. My mother, who fed me TV dinners, baked a peach cobbler with fresh peaches every Monday, her day off from the diner where she waited tables. She always said that Sunday was her Saturday and Monday was her Sunday. What I knew was that none of her days were for me. And for many of those Mondays off and on during my childhood, God, to my child's mind, would stop by and eat an entire eight by eight pan of cobbler. My mother never ate any of the cobbler herself. She said she didn't like peaches. She would shoo me out of the kitchen before God could offer me any, but I doubted he would have offered, even if I'd sat right down next to him. God was an old fat man, like a black Santa, and I imagined my mother's peach cobbler contributing to his girth. Some Mondays, God would arrive after dinner and leave as I lay curled up on the couch watching Little House on the Prairie in the living room. Thank you. JR 上野駅公園口を読みます。えー、ゆう、みぎです。死ねば、死んだ人と再会できるものと思っていた。遠く離れた人を、近くで見ることができたり、いつでも触れたり、感じたりすることができると思っていた。死ねば、何かがわかるのだと思っていた。その瞬間、生きている意味や死んでいく意味が見えるのだと思っていた。霧が晴れるようにはっきりと。でも、気がつくとこの公園に戻っていた。どこにも行き着かず、何もわからず、無数の疑問が競り合ったままの自分を残して、性の外側から存在する可能性を失ったものとしてそれでも絶え間なく考え絶え間なく感じて時は過ぎない時は終わらない I'm Morgan Giles, translator at Tokyo Ueno Station I thought that once I was dead, I would be reunited with the dead, that I could see close up those who were far away, touch them and feel them at all times. I thought something would be resolved by death. I believed that at the final moment, the meaning of life and death would appear to me clearly like a fog lifting. But then I realized that I was back in the park. I was not going anywhere. I had not understood anything. I was still stunned by the same numberless doubts. Only I was now outside of life looking in as someone who has lost the capacity to exist, now ceaselessly thinking, ceaselessly feeling. Time does not pass, time never ends. Right, I am in a rapidly changing light scenario, so I'm going to be fast.、Um, that last group was incredible. I now need pink shelves and a sitting chair like Disha has. Um, and we have another exciting group to come. So I'd like to introduce Tracy Chi, Tommy Blount, Tamara Payne, Lydia Millett, and Yunus Hassan Kamiri, the author of The Family Clause, translated from the Swedish by Alice Menzies. And now to our readers again. Hi, I'm Tracy Chi. I'll be reading from We Are Not Free, a novel and stories about the Japanese American incarcerations of World War II. This excerpt is from Chapter Two when, in early 1943, half of Japantown, San Francisco, has gotten their eviction orders from the federal government, and they're having to sell off their belongings because they're only allowed to take two suitcases when they're shipped off to the detention centers. Over the weekend, signs pop up all around the neighborhood evacuation sale, furniture sale, big sale, prices smashed. Me, Moss, Minnow, Twitchy, and Frankie get together to help out the guys who have to leave. At Stan Katsumoto's Family Grocery, we sort through the shelves, marking down prices on rice and kombu and tea. 
when Moss isn't paying attention, I tag him with a 50% off sticker and Switchy adds a five cent tag to the seat of his pants. One of the other fellas snickers. Me and Switchy smother our laughter and stick Moss with six more tags before Mrs. Katsumoto looks up from the counter and goes, Aya, what are you doing? Masaru's a handsome boy. We can get at least a dollar for him. I wish I could tell you what Moss's face looks like, but me and Twitchy are already out the door, running down the block as Moss roars after us. When we break for lunch, Mrs. Katsumoto posts a note on the door beneath the words, I am an American. It's a message to their customers, thanking them for 20 years of patronage. Stan stares at it for a second and cocks his eyebrow. You sure about this, Ma? We don't want them to get the wrong idea about us. What wrong idea? Mrs. Katsumoto asks. That we're decent people or something. What's wrong with that? Decent people don't kick out other decent people. So if we're decent, they can't be decent. You're gonna cause an existential crisis, Ma. If white people aren't decent, are they anything? She sighs and presses down a bit of tape with her thumbnail. It's the right thing to do. For us. For us? The buzzing returns sharp and metallic. You think other people to make them feel good, and good is the last thing anyone should feel about what's happening to us. Mr. Katsumoto says nothing. He lowers his head over the counter, silently marking down packages of umeboshi. Thank you. I'm Tommy Blount, and I will be reading um, the first of four title poems from my collection, Fantasia for the Man in Blue. Fantasia for the Man in Blue. You know good and well you can't be out here in the dark morning to take in the moon, full as the bowl of light attached to this police cruiser. Like a great elephant shoots air through its trunk before it charges off to safety from a mouse in one of those old black and white cartoons. You shriek in a debutante's pitch, even though there are reports you are as large as an elephant. <laughs> Car thefts in the area. The man in blue explains after he asks, where do you think you're going? It's unusual to see your kind walking at this hour. You're an elephant who's really just a man sweating away in a mascot's costume. You mumble in a dress. You fumble in a dress that isn't your address, but mine. Oh, you've done it now. Don't say anything else. Let me take over this body. Soften what letters will bend. I am a poet after all. Don't worry, you'll see. He'll wish us a good morning and let us go after he bends us over the black hood. Thank you. Hello, I am Tamara Payne, and I'll be reading from The Dead or Arising. I am a co-author, written with my father, Lost Payne. I'll be reading from the opening of the book. The metallic clicking of hoofbeats on the gravel road draw five-year-old Wilfred to the small pane window. His mother, wiping her hands, hurried to the front door as a group of horsemen with flickering torches rode up to the wood frame home on the outskirts of Omaha, Nebraska. Little, yelled one of the half dozen men. Louise Little said that her husband was not at home and with the tree leaves rustling in the evening breeze, the horsemen steadied their mounts in the front yard and declared that they were the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Get that nigger out here now, one of the strangers shouted. Haughtingly, the young housewife said that her family didn't cause trouble or bother neighbors that they minded their own business. Seen against the flickering kerosene light, Mrs. Little stood taller than the average man of her day at more than five feet, eight inches. She was pregnant. She was big, Wilfred said. She was expecting at any time carrying a boy they would name Malcolm. 
who would be born on May 19, 1925. Y'all better get on out of town, said the man in front, exclaiming that they don't tolerate troublemakers, bristling, bristling before the young family. The Klansmen clutched their shotguns and made all kinds of threats, and chiefly the absent man of the house. The unfolding drama puzzled the eldest child of the household. My mother kept arguing, Wilfred said. The Klan leader got mad. He took the butt of his rifle and knocked the front window out. Baby brother Philbert started crying in a, black in a back room, and three-year-old Hilda tugged at her mother's house dress. If fear of the gunman gripped Mrs. Little, her children detected no sign in her tone and body language. The children, in fact, drew lasting strength from her manner in which their mother stood her ground before the bullying white strangers on horseback. However, Wilfred would conclude later that it was helped greatly that his father was indeed not at home. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lydia Millett, and I'll be reading from a novel called A Children's Bible. It looks like this. The Great House had been built by robber barons in the 19th century, a palatial retreat for the green months. Our parents, those so-called figures of authority, roamed its rooms in vague circuits beneath the broad beams, their objectives murky and of no general interest. They liked to drink. It was their hobby, or, said one of us, maybe a form of worship. They drank wine and beer and whiskey and gin, also tequila, rum and vodka. At midday, they called it the hair of the dog. It seemed to keep them contented or, or going at least. In the evenings, they assembled to eat food and drink more. Dinner was the only meal we had to attend, and even that we resented. They sat us down and talked about nothing. They aimed their conversation like a dull gray beam. It hit us and lulled us into a stupor. What they said was so boring, it filled us with frustration, and after more minutes, rage. Later, the talk grew louder, freed of our influence. Some of them emitted sudden, harsh barks, apparently laughing. As the evenings wore on, some parents got it into their heads to dance. A flash of life would move their lumpen bodies. Sad spectacle. They flopped, blasting their old-time music. Beat on the brat, beat on the brat, beat on the brat with a baseball bat, oh yeah. The ones with no flashes of life sat in their chairs watching the dancers. Slack-faced, listless, for practical purposes, deceased, but less embarrassing. Some parents paired off and crept into the second floor bedrooms where a few boys spied on them from between the slats of closet doors, saw them perform their dark acts. At times they felt stirrings, I knew this, although they didn't admit it. More often, repugnance. Most of us were headed to junior or senior year after the summer was over, but a few hadn't even hit puberty. There was a range of ages. In short, some were innocents. Others performed dark acts of their own. Those were not as repugnant. Thank you. So my name is Yunus Hassan Kimiri. I will be reading from this book called uh, Papa Klaus Hulan in Swedish and The Family Clause in English. And I'm just going to read a few lines from the first chapter. En farfar som är en pappa är tillbaka i landet som han aldrig har lämnat. Han står i kön till passkontrollen. Om polisen bakom glasrutan ställer misstänksamma frågor ska pappan som är en farfar hålla sig lugn. Han ska inte kalla polisen för grisen. Han ska inte fråga polisen om han har köpt sin polisuniform på påståret. Istället ska han le och visa upp sitt pass och påminna polisen om att han är medborgare i det här landet. Och att han aldrig har varit borta från sin familj. Längre än sex månader. Varför? För att hans familj bor här. Hans älskade barn. Hans fantastiska barnbarn. Hans svikande exfru. Han ska aldrig resa bort längre än sex månader. Sex månader i max. Oftast är han borta i fem månader och 30 dagar. Ibland fem månader och 27 dagar. Hello, uh, I'm Alice Menzies and I'm the translator of The Family Clause and I'll read the same passage as Yunus in English. The grandfather who is a father is back in the country he never left. He's standing in the queue for border control. If the officer behind the glass asks any suspicious questions, the father who is a grandfather will keep calm. He won't call the officer a pig. He won't ask whether the officer bought their uniform from a mail order catalogue. 
Instead, he'll smile and hold up his passport and remind them, the officer, that he's a citizen of this country and that he's never been away for longer than six months. Why? Because his family lives here, his beloved children, his fantastic grandchildren, his deceitful ex-wife. He would never go away for more than six months. Six months is the max. He generally goes away for five months and 30 days, sometimes five months and 27 days. All right. Um, thank you so much. Everyone was absolutely wonderful. Um, and now I'd like to thank a few more people. Um, we thanked our sponsors up top and thank you to them again. But we also for the awards have a number of digital table hosts, including HarperCollins, the Linton Family Foundation, Macmillan and Wiley. And we're supported by Arcadia Publishing, Grove Atlantic, Grey Wolf and WW Norton and Company. We're also so lucky to have the support of Jenko and Nesbitt and the Susan and Kenneth Wallach Foundation. We could not do this work without their support. Let me tell you what it looks like to have a year without a gala. It's not pretty. Um, you can join all these folks too. Um, team will pop it in the link. Um, but also I wanna say a huge thank you to our production team. Pivoting to video when you are books requires a lot of people who have some technological know-how. So thanks to really useful media who are behind the scenes getting this up and to you, as well as to our captioner, Amy Diaz, who's helping us to make sure that this event is accessible. So now on to our final group of wonderful readers, Case and Calendar, May May Burson Brugge, Carla Cornejo Villa, ah, you know what y'all, got the tough ones together, Carla Cornejo Villa Vicenceo, Charles Yu, Anya Kampman, author of High as the Waters Rise, translated from the German by Anne Poston. Hi everyone, I'm Kaysen Calendar, and I'm the author of King and the Dragonflies. It happened at the funeral. We were in the front row at the over, overheated church. Someone was crying behind me. Most were swatting their programs to push away the heat. My dad used to tell me all the time that boys don't cry, but sitting there that day, his face was wet, salted water dripping from his eyes, off his nose and chin, and he didn't bother wiping his face, didn't bother trying to hide it. I didn't even know so much water could be inside of a person, like he was trying to hide an entire ocean beneath his skin. My mom's hands were clenched hard around the crumpled up cut tissue in her lap, and she was staring without blinking, her eyes wide, staring right at where my, bro my brother's old body was lying in his casket. I know most folks like to say a dead person looks like they're sleeping, but I didn't think so. I know what my brother looked like when he was asleep. He was always dreaming always smirking or frowning at something I couldn't see, outright laughing before he mumbled and turned over, some nights even speaking to me. We shared the same bed in our cramped little room, and sometimes I'd kick him just so that he'd shut up and let me sleep too, but other times I'd sit and curl my knees to my chest and listen. He'd mostly say things that made no sense or speak so low I couldn't hear what he was telling me, but sometimes he'd whisper secrets about the universe. It was almost like he was given a special ticket to see a magic world in his dreams, even if he couldn't remember anything when he woke up. That boy lying there in that casket wasn't asleep. He wasn't even my brother. He was like a snake's second skin, shed off and forgotten, empty on the ground. I was mad that day. Why would we sit here crying over some forgotten skin? It's like mourning a moss cocoon. If Khalid had seen us there crying over that old body of his, what would he have done? My brother could slip into a whole other universe in his sleep. We're all made of light. Thank you. I'm Amy Burson Brookie. And I'm going to read from my book, A Treatise on Stars. Their skies are full of life. She describes starlight as scalar without properties of distance or time. Any spirit in matter she calls star walking remote viewing, meditation, intuition, plants she was shown, and any soul possessing a certain shine 
she calls starlight. The power of relation came through their extraordinary yellow eyes, she tells me. You're looking into a star, convex, immense, flashing colors through opalescent, flowing, nuclear fusion. I feel separated from home now. I look up at night sky with great longing. They showed me earth through their eyes. Their oneness extends to us, whereas I'm in the dark. Then it opens onto luminescence. There's a lot of snow. There's a lot of stars, huge, no horizon and very bright. I see the Pleiades. I feel like a wolf looking toward home. Phew, a shooting star just dropped there onto snow. So I go over to it. A crystal has dropped on the snow and there's light, a face in the stone. It's as if I'm looking up through the sky and things are very clear and I'm coming up through the ice. I've been below all this time and now I see stars. Thank you. I was muted. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carla Cornejo Villavicencio. I am fine just going by Carla. Um, I'm dressed in homage to Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are important to my community. And I will be reading from the Undocumented Americans. When I meet kids who suffer, I want to teach them everything I know about the world, which isn't a lot and basically amounts to go to Harvard, make hella money, read contracts before you sign them, bring two tiny bottles of Kahlua and a tiny bottle of mouthwash when you have to go with your parents to their biopsy results. I follow my own advice while trying to hold off on the suicidal ideation while trying to be as socially fucking mobile as socially fucking possible. And then these kids fucking find me. And what do I do? But invite them into my heart and tell them, babes, go to school, climb the ranks, kill the salutatorian, make it look like an accident. And in your valedictory address, remind your school that cops are pigs and ICE are Nazis, and you are John at the foot of the cross, Jesus's most loved apostle, maybe his lover, and you're in the holy word. Escape to my home for some chamomile tea in RuPaul. There will always be room for you. I love you and forever will. Thank you and gracias a todos los mojados. How are you? And I'll be reading from my novel, Interior Chinatown. Interior Golden Palace. Ever since you were a boy, you've dreamt of being Kung Fu guy. You're not Kung Fu guy. You are currently background oriental male, but you've been practicing. Maybe tomorrow will be the day. Interior Golden Palace. Ever since you were a boy, You've dreamt of being Kung Fu guy. You are not Kung Fu guy. You are currently Oriental guy making a weird face, but you've been practicing. Maybe tomorrow will be the day. Willis Wu, Asian actor. Skills, Kung Fu. Moderate proficiency. Fluent in accented English. Able to do face of great shame on command. Resume, disgraced son. Delivery guy. Silent henchman, guy who runs in and gets kicked in the face, striving immigrant, generic Asian man. Your mother is played in no particular order, pretty oriental flower, Asiatic seductress, young dragon lady, slightly less young dragon lady, restaurant hostess, beautiful maiden number one, dead beautiful maiden number one, old Asian woman. Your father has been at various times Twin dragon, wizened Chinaman, guy in a soiled t-shirt, inscrutable grocery owner in a soiled t-shirt, egg roll cook, young Asian man, Sifu, the mysterious Kung Fu master, old Asian man. Take what you can get, 
try to build a life, a life at the margin made from bit parts. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anja Kampmann. I'm the author of Wie hoch die Wasser steigen, Highest the Waters Rise, translated by Anne Poston. I'm going to read a passage from the back of the book, a flashback of one of the protagonists. Später hatte es andere Nächte gegeben. Ein Pub in der Nähe von Aberdeen, Fischer, Hochseefischer und Ölleute. Ein Helikopter war abgestürzt. Er hatte sich in der Luft gedreht und war mit der Maschine zuerst ins Wasser gestürzt. Es war die Trauerfeier für die Boys, junge Rotzer, Ingenieure, die es im sechs Grad kalten Wasser der Nordsee nicht geschafft hatten. Und sie waren beide da. Václav und Matthias, und sie wussten, dass es etwas anderes war als der künstliche Rauch und die Wellenmaschinen bei den Übungen, die sie alle paar Jahre absolvieren mussten. Es war etwas anderes als die Städte in ihrem sicheren Schweigen, als hätte man ihnen die Haut aufgerissen und etwas anderes, etwas wie Seele schaute da hervor. Das hatte er gedacht, dass dieses Wort nur Sinn hatte inmitten von ihnen. Hi, I'm Anne Poston. I'm the translator of Anja Kampmann's Wie hoch die Wasser steigen, High as the Waters Rise. Later, there had been other nights. A pub near Aberdeen, fishermen, deep sea fishermen, and oil people. A helicopter had crashed. It had flipped in the air and had crashed engine first into the water. It was the memorial service for the boys young punks, engineers who hadn't made it in the six degree water of the North Sea. And they were both there, Václav and Matthias. And they knew that this was different from the artificial smoke and the wave machines from the exercises they had to pass every few years. It was different from the cities and their safe silence, as if someone had torn away their skin and something else, something like a soul, showed through. That's what he'd thought that this word only had a meaning among them. It seems unreal that such a wonderful group of authors and translators reading could have gone that quickly. And here we are at the end of our program. Um, I'm so sorry that we can't all be together in real life, but I'm so pleased that everybody brought us their wonderful bookshelves and their wonderful reading voices and their wonderful work. Um, I hope you all, uh, head out and grab these books, order them from your local, um, borrow them from your library, however you get them. They are extraordinary. And hearing just little pieces of all of these books that range from so many topics, so many places, um, it's world opening. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to our new school partners. We miss you. We can't wait to get back into your real physical space. Um, these books are going to be celebrated next Wednesday, live at the National Book Awards. We hope to see you all there. Um, and to the finalists, thank you all so much for being here tonight and again next week. Thank you for being a part of our family. We are better and bigger and richer because of it. Um, so everybody be safe and please take good care of yourselves and of one another. Good night.